All right, so this week I like to go over memorization, uh, the programming concept. And it was requested in one of the comments, but also because I'm preparing for interviews, I have to go over this stuff anyway. So it's good to document it. So if I ever have to go over it again, I can just rewatch this video. Anyway, besides that, uh, it was also pointed out recently that the chirping from the fire alarm was driving people crazy. My apologies. Um, the battery has been changed and hopefully you will no longer hear it in the future. With that being said, let's get it. All right, so let's start off by defining what memorization is. And to note, I say it really slowly, but that word, um, memorization, because I never know if I'm saying it properly. It's one of those things I've always read and never really heard. Anyway, besides that, starting off with the first sentence. In computing, memorization, or memorization, two different spellings, is an optimization technique used primarily to speed up computer programs by storing the results of expensive function calls and returning the cast result when the same input occur again. Uh, so let's go over that sentence. This technique, memorization, is more or less having a cast of results that are associated to expensive function calls. As in, uh, you take in this input, you calculated the first time, it took a really long time to calculate, you don't want to do that again, so you store it somewhere. And next time you get that same input, instead of doing the calculation again, you go to your lookup table or something along those lines, your cache, and then you just return it back. So that's pretty straightforward. And if we scroll down a little bit to the overview, that go a little bit more in depth. So starting from here, a memorized function remembers the results corresponding to some set of specific inputs. Subsequent calls with remembered inputs return the remembered result rather than recalculating it, thus eliminating the primary cost of a call with given parameters from all but the first call made to the function with those parameters. So that's kind of exactly what I said just now, um, where you you remember the input. So if you forget the same input twice, you only have to worry about the cost of running the full function call during the first time you receive that input. The second time you receive it, you already remembered it and you just return the cast result. And as a result, the primary cost or the cost of running this function typically happens only at the initial time you see the input. All subsequent times are just fast because you're pulling it from cash. All right, starting from here, a function can only be memorized if it is referentially transparent. That is, only if calling the function has exactly the same effect as replacing that function call with its return value. And to be, what they mean to say here, to be more explicit, is if you have a function and your function takes a parameter, let's say A, f of a will give you b and that is always the case regardless of when you call your function or how you call your function and if that remains true then the act of uh, caching those values caching that input and value is the same as calling the function so for a subsequent time if you get the same input a instead of calling the function and running through that cost you can just look it up in your cache and you know for a fact that the answer is going to be b well, you know that B, it's okay to return B because the function would have returned B anyway. And I want to read this last sentence here because I think this is important. While related to lookup tables, since memorization often uses such tables in its implementation, memorization populates its cache of results transparently on the fly as needed rather than in advance. And the distinction here is more or less academic, but at the same time, it's needed for implementation purposes. So for lookup tables, lookup tables, you can populate at any point in time. You can populate them during, you can populate them before function calls. It doesn't really matter when you populate them, but you have the option of populating them prior to any function call being made. For memorization, populating the cache happens transparently on the fly as in 
when you make a function call, let's say A comes and you make that function call with the input A and you get a result B. At that point in time, during the call, you're going to insert that key and value into your cache to remember it for a subsequent call so that you can just look it up. And to see an example of this, if you scroll down, they did factorials and we'll rewrite this in Rust so we can see it. But, um, well, this is the example of factorial regularly. And then down here is the add addition of a lookup table. More or less, because factorial is factorial, they're doing it recursively here, where they have, if n is equal to zero, then return one. This is the base case. Else return factorial n minus one times n. And this will recursively go all the way down the stack and up the stack doing n times n minus one till they get to one. In essence, just a factorial. When you come down to the memorization version of it, the only real difference is they added a step here. So starting from the top, we have if n equals zero, then return one. So the base case is here. If n is else if n is in the lookup table, so check to see if n is in the lookup table. If it is, return the value for n in the lookup table. And if it's not, do the calculation. Let x equal factorial n minus one times n. And then before you return it, make sure you store it in the lookup table so that next time if you get the same input, you can just find it in the lookup table and you wouldn't have to go through this process. And then you return x. And they give more details about how that looks in terms of factorials and what it saves you in terms of runtime. But we can see that when we do it in Rust. So let me open my editor. So for this video, I already wrote out the code um, to see what I did. Oh, I'm gonna go walk through the code, but first I would like to show you that I have the logging implemented. So let's look at my cargo.toml file. And I think that's one directory up. Yeah, there we go. So let's cargo.toml. Um, the only thing I really have here is log and n logger, which we already covered in the previous video. So just know that. And let's get to it. Lib. So first, let's go over the factorial regular without memorization, right? I wrote that here. Um, as you can see, it just takes in i32, returns an i32. I32. I put a debug statement here so we can track it to see the different levels of the stack as it goes down. Um, and then the recursive call as we covered in the recursion video is simply just a math statement where if n equals to zero, return one. If n equals to anything else, return factorial n minus one times n, just like they had in the Wikipedia page. So it's pretty straightforward. And then I wrote a test to cover it so we can see it. And oh, so this is something I talked about in the login video but didn't demonstrate in the test module, right? You created a init function, which is in the documentation for the logger. And then um, in your test, which test factorial is right here, bring that up higher on the page, you run the initialize function within the test, and now you have access to the uh, debug statements, if you have any, there are any logging statements, if you wanna see them printed out. So as you can see here in the test case, there are two. There is a test case five and 120. Um, in terms of how I wrote my test, I created a test case struct that takes input and expected. So to read this, it's more, here is a vector of test cases. Here's the test case with my input as five. What I expect to return is I expect 120 to be the return value. Here's the input of three and I expect six to be returned. And then for cases in case, sorry, for case in cases, I just iterate over that and 
make sure all of them are as expected, that the result is equal to the case that expected. And this line does not need to be here at all. Remove that. Cool. So let's look at the test, or let's run the test. And to run the test, I just want to run that one test. I have Rust log debug because it needs the environment variable um, set for the logging to show. Cargo tests, and then I have a partial name for the test, so it only runs this test and not the other test as well. And in order to see the debug, you need to have no capture passed to your test. Um, What's the syntax is dash dash space dash dash, so it gets passed to the other internal binary. And let's see it. So as you can see here, right, the first test case went five, and we expected 120 as the result. And in the factorial function, we had the debug statement. So here we see the five, four, three, two, one, zero. And then it stopped, because at zero, we hit our base case. And um, if n equals zero, return one. Then it went back up the stack. We didn't track back up the stack. We just tracked going down. And in the second test, test case, we see that it starts from three, and it goes three, two, one, and then zero, base case. So this is exactly what we expect from a factorial function that is written recursively. So yeah, everything is as we expect. Now to add memorization to it, one of the approaches I took, or the approach I thought was most straightforward, is just using a dictionary and creating a struct to hold it. So let's go back to the code and we can go over that real quick. All right, so I created a struct called factorial and I gave it a cache, which is just a hash map i32 i32 where the first one is going to be the um, input and then the second one is going to be the output simple enough and then in terms of implementation I gave it a new function just because said we should in Rust not necessarily need it but we should but coming down to the meat and potatoes of it the code actually didn't really change much so we still have factorial it is now a mutable self because um, I'm updating the cache. So it needs to be able to change itself. But the n input is still i32. The result is still i32. I still have the debug statement right at the beginning of it so we can track how it goes down the stack. And then one thing that's slightly different from the Wikipedia page is that I put the uh, lookup at the beginning of the call instead of within the middle of it. So they did an if, else, if, else. I did a check the lookup table, the cache, and then I added the recursive call. And the main reason why I did that is because it was just easier to write this way. So we come to n, we do the same match statement. If n equals zero, return one. If it does not equal zero, we have the recursive call here, set it to x, and then we insert the key and value, so n and x, as we're going along the the, the stack traversal for the, this recursive call of factorial. And then we return x. So more or less, the code hasn't really changed much. There's just the addition of, on line 30, the insert into the cache. And on line 22 to 24, checking the cache and returning it if it exists there. Okay. So in terms of tests, here we go. I wrote three test cases. And the reason why I wrote three test cases is because I want to exemplify what it really means to, or what it looks like to retrieve things from this cache. So we have the init function that initializes the debugger. And then we create a new struct of our factorial, right? But for our test cases, we have five. And the reason I use five is because, um, one, we're already familiar with it because we used it in the first one. But also, it goes five, four, three, two, one, zero. So 
after you run this first test case, all of these cases should be in the cache. As in the next time you run a call for factorial, if it is any of these numbers, we only have to look at the lookup table and then we're done. And that's shown in the second test case where we see three and the return value is six. So another thing I wanted to demonstrate um, is if you have five, like zero to five in the lookup table, what happens if you look up something that is a greater input than something you already received? Well, that's what seven's for. Seven is greater than five. So we're gonna calculate seven, we're gonna calculate six, and then we're gonna see five, and then since five is in the lookup table, we're just gonna return from there. And we don't have to go through the other numbers below that because they're already stored. So uh, what this more or less exemplifies is that one, if something was already previously done in terms of work, you can just retrieve it from the cache. But two, if something was partially done from work, or like the work is partially done because you've done most of the lower cases, then you only have to do the above cases before that point where you reach the um, point of you can get everything else from the cache. And yeah, let's run that real quick. So for this one, mem debug. So the case of five, we see five, four, three, two, one, zero, right? That's the first test case, makes sense. Then for the second test case, three, and there's nothing else here. Because that was already in the cache, we were able just to pull it out. And then for the third test case, we see seven, six, five, and then it stops, showing that we had to do the work for seven and six because it wasn't already in the cache. But once we got to five, we were able to pull um, the intermediate result from the cache and then we were done with the call. So let's go back to the code real quick and just review it again. All right, so taking a look back at the code again um, and thinking about the properties that memorization, uh, or properties that are needed for memorization to happen, which are you have a function um, and for input A, you always are going to receive a result B, like that is a constant. So if you have a function that meets that criteria, then I think in Rust, this is probably a really simple way of implementing memorization, where you create a struct around whatever that function is. In this case, it was factorial. So I created a factorial struct, and then you just add a cast to it. And then more or less, when you get to the actual function part, in this case, it's gonna be a method now, simply adding a check for the cast and then insert it into the cast is all you really need to change that one function call into something that's memorized, memorized, memo, memorized. I think that's how you pronounce it. Really weird with that word. So yeah, that's really all I wanted to cover in this video. With that being said, if you like it, hit like, subscribe. Outside of that, till next time. Peace.